In the bustling heart of Chinatown, San Francisco, a place filled with the vibrant chatter of markets, martial law was born. For the people living there, it was a busy life, a ceaseless fight for survival that defined the families living day to day. Law's parents immigrated to America with dreams of opportunity, hoping to escape the harsh realities they once faced. They poured their energy into opening a small restaurant, believing hard work would bring success. The establishment was modest, a place for locals to gather for traditional food and a sense of familiarity. But it struggled to thrive amid stiff competition from more well-established businesses in the area. The restaurant's income barely covered the bills, and Marshall grew up painfully aware of his family's financial struggles. While other children spent their afternoons playing, Marshall's childhood was spent helping out at the restaurant. By the time he was tall enough to reach the stove, he was already cooking alongside his mother, chopping vegetables, flipping walks, and greeting customers. He learned to maintain a composed demeanor despite exhaustion or complaints. Yet, amidst the long hours of labor, Marshall found relief in an unexpected passion. Law found his escape in martial arts. Growing up in Chinatown, he was immersed in the cultural legacy of Chinese fighting styles, films, old masters, and stories of heroes who forged their paths through sheer determination. He spent hours captivated by old kung fu movies. Enthralled by the fighter's precision and skill, he began imitating the moves he saw on screen, practicing stances and kicks in his short breaks. At first, it was merely a way to pass the time, a fleeting escape for a boy weighed down by responsibilities. But before long, he realized martial arts was more than just a pastime. For martial law, it felt like freedom. In his moments of practice, he was no longer the struggling son of restaurateurs. He was powerful, someone in control of his own destiny. Marshall's parents, preoccupied with their struggling business, couldn't afford formal martial arts lessons. But this didn't stop him. He trained by himself. Late at night, after the restaurant closed, he would sneak away to a secluded park, practicing under dim streetlights until his body ached and his hands were raw from striking makeshift targets. Unbeknownst to Marshall, a mysterious old man would watch from the shadows. He was Master Han Yip, a highly skilled retired martial arts instructor who lived nearby. For weeks, Master Yip had observed Marshall's determination, his raw, untamed energy. As Marshall struck at his imaginary opponents, Master Yip stepped into the clearing. The master saw potential in the young man and offered to train him for free. Marshall, initially defensive, began to soften at the man's words. Deep down, he knew he needed guidance if he wanted to improve. He bowed in respect, and from that night on, Master Han Yip took him under his wing. They trained together in the quiet hours after the city had fallen asleep. Under Master Yip's tutelage, Marshall learned discipline, control, and the deeper philosophies of martial arts, the importance of balance in both combat and life. As the years passed, the two grew close. However, Master Yip, who was already very old when he met Marshall, didn't have much time left. He would use the last of his strength to pass on all his knowledge. One evening, after an intense training session, he sat beside Marshall, his breaths shallow. With a faint smile, he told Marshall that his journey as his teacher was nearing its end and that he had given all he could. He spoke of passing the torch, reminding Marshall that it was now his duty to carry forward what he had learned. Shortly after, Master Han Yip sadly passed away peacefully in his sleep, leaving Marshall devastated, 
but with a profound sense of responsibility and an unwavering commitment to martial arts. As Marshall entered his late teens, his fighting skills flourished. He quietly earned a reputation in the neighborhood as a formidable fighter, someone you'd want by your side when trouble arose. He dreamed of one day opening his own dojo, a place where he could teach full-time and share his passion for martial arts with others. But life was far from simple. The restaurant continued to struggle, and his parents were aging, their dreams of success slowly giving way to the harsh reality of survival. Marshall worked tirelessly, splitting his time between helping at the restaurant and training. With each passing year, his dream of opening a dojo seemed to drift further away, buried beneath the weight of his family's needs. Eventually, the financial burden became insurmountable, and Marshall's parents made the difficult decision to return to China, leaving behind the dreams they had nurtured. Marshall chose to stay in the United States, determined to make something of himself. He couldn't bear to abandon the place where he had grown up, nor the opportunities, however slim, that still lay before him. In the months that followed, Marshall found himself alone, but not without hope. He took on work wherever he could find it, often in the same Chinatown restaurants that had once contributed to his family's financial troubles. During this time, he met his future wife, a kind-hearted woman who worked at the same establishments. They found comfort in each other's company, sharing the same understanding of hard work and survival. After they married, they had a child together, Forest Law, bringing a new sense of purpose to Marshall's life. Even as Marshall continued to rely on odd jobs, he never lost sight of his passion for martial arts. Now in his early 20s, Marshall's life took an unexpected turn. One day, while training at a local gym, he caught the eye of Paul Phoenix, a brash and ambitious fighter. Paul watched Marshall's rigorous routine. Impressed by Law's intensity and skill, and driven by his desire to test himself against the best, Paul approached Marshall and struck up a conversation. What began as a casual exchange soon turned into a sparring session, and from that day, the two fighters became inseparable. They pushed each other to their limits, forging a deep friendship through combat and mutual respect. Marshall became more than a friend to Paul. He was a mentor, a rival, and a brother in arms. During one of their late night training sessions, they confided in each other about their dreams. Paul spoke with unabashed ambition declaring his goal to become the strongest fighter in the universe. Marshall, in turn, shared his dream of opening a dojo, a place where he could pass on the lessons from Master Han Yip. Paul admired Marshall's tenacity and discipline, while Marshall found Paul's confidence and fierce determination inspiring. Their bond grew beyond friendship. It became a partnership built on shared dreams and aspirations. They trained for hours, perfecting their techniques, learning from each other's strengths, and laughing at their mistakes. Paul quickly grew close to Marshall's family, spending time with Marshall, his wife, and their young son, Forrest. The two men shared not only their passion for fighting, but also a camaraderie that kept them grounded despite the struggles they faced in life. Back at Marshall's home, the two had returned from a long day of sparring. While they enjoyed their rest and recovery, the television played in the background, broadcasting local news and commercials. Suddenly, an advertisement caught their attention, an announcement for the upcoming King of Iron Fist tournament. The screen displayed images of fighters from around the world, each more formidable than the last, and boasted substantial prize money for the winner. Marshall and Paul exchanged a glance, a silent understanding passing between them. They both knew this was the opportunity they had been waiting for, a chance to prove themselves on the world stage and perhaps secure their futures. 
What do you say, Marshal? We enter this thing together. And if either of us wins, we split the prize money. We can't pass up this opportunity. Well, I think we're both more than good enough for these guys. So you up for it? All right. You've got yourself a deal. We'll take on the best, and we'll do it together. There you go. No pain, no gain. I'll be willing to bet that he's gonna be there. Time to settle the score. With a handshake, they sealed their pact. Although the money was important, this tournament meant far more. It was about the challenge, the thrill of competition, and the chance to rise above the struggles that had defined their lives. Together, they would enter the King of Iron Fist tournament, each determined to give it everything they had. Welcome to the King of Iron Fist tournament. The King of Iron Fist tournament brought together fighters from all corners of the globe each with their own ambitions and motivations. For martial law, it was an opportunity to prove himself and earn the resources needed to realize his dream of opening his dojo. Determined to make it as far as possible, he would face every challenge head on with the resilience forged in him since childhood. Although he was unaware of it at the time, everything he had been working towards had led to this tournament to earn his claim to be among the greatest fighters in the world. Marshall's first major matchup in the tournament was against Wang Jinrei, an elderly master with decades of experience and an unassuming but strong presence. Wang Jinrei was a brave old man with a kind heart. A practitioner of Shiniroku Goken, he continued to embody generosity and kindness, even while living as a recluse in the Mishima Gardens. Wang was a close friend of Jinpachi Mishima, Heihachi's father, and the two shared a deep bond of mutual respect. After Jinpachi suddenly disappeared, Wang placed his faith in Heihachi to continue growing the Mishima Zaibatsu with honor, unaware of the dark deeds Heihachi had committed. As a former overseas Chinese merchant, Wang sympathized deeply with his fellow countrymen, always striving to uplift those around him while remaining steadfast in his values. However, suspicious of Heihachi's potential involvement in Jinpachi's disappearance years ago, Wang decided to enter the tournament to observe Heihachi's conduct firsthand. Before the fight began, Wang observed Marshall preparing. The movements were familiar, the precision unmistakable. Wang's eyes narrowed slightly as he approached Marshall. His curiosity peaked. That's right. How did you know? Ah, He passed away some time ago. He spent his last moments passing his knowledge on to me. It was so sudden. I miss him. I understand. He Martial Law versus Wang Jinrei. Wang's mastery of his traditional martial arts posed a formidable challenge for Marshall, who was more accustomed to facing raw power and aggression than refined skill and deep wisdom. Wang's movements were calm and deliberate, each attack calculated with precision. After an intense exchange of techniques and counters, 
the match ended in a draw. Both fighters were exhausted, but Wang chose to concede, recognizing Marshall's youthful determination and spirit. He bowed deeply, his voice filled with respect. Master, I won't forget this. Thank you, Master Wang. Lao Shi, I'll heed your words. After his victory over Wang, Marshall found himself matched up against none other than Paul Phoenix. The tournament had pitted the two friends against each other, and both men knew there could be no holding back. For Marshall, it was bittersweet. He deeply admired Paul, but only one of them could advance. The battle between Marshall and Paul would be fierce, with each fighter giving everything they had, pushing each other beyond their limits. Their late-night training sessions would come to life in the tournament arena, but this time, they weren't sparring. They were fighting to win. Martial Law versus Paul Phoenix. Paul's power clashed with Marshall's speed once again. It was an intense match, but despite Paul's strength, this time it was Marshall's resolve to advance that pushed him beyond his usual limits. In the final moments of the fight, Marshall overcame Paul, landing a decisive blow that left his friend unable to continue. How did this happen? I was the one who was supposed to face Kazuya. I'm proud of you, Law. But I can't hide my disappointment. Kazuya was mine to defeat. Fighting's full of surprises, Paul. You're strong, but remember, it's not just about who you fight, but how you fight. But don't beat yourself up. Our fight could have gone either way. I guess. This is your time, Marshal. Keep going. Show them what we're made of. I'll be here for you. Thanks, Paul. I'm glad we're doing this together. Marshall's next challenge pitted him against Nina Williams, a lethal assassin known for her ruthless efficiency and precision, never missing her target. You seem like you're not here to play around. Ready for a real challenge? I didn't come here for games. I'm here for victory. That's the spirit. Let's see what you got. Marshall Law versus Nina Williams. <laughs> Marshall landed a final blow that knocked Nina off her feet, securing his victory. She glared at him, her eyes fierce. But there was a glimmer of surprise and respect for Law's pure skill in her expression. Without a word, she stood up and left the arena.
the arena buzzed with electric anticipation. After days of intense battles, broken bones, and shattered dreams, the King of Iron Fist tournament had reached its climax. The crowd's roar subsided as the announcer's voice boomed through the speakers. Get ready for the next battle. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the final bout to decide who will challenge Heihachi Mishima. Martial law will face off against Kazuya Mishima. The audience erupted in cheers and gasps. In one corner of the arena, martial law stood, his face as determined as ever. Beside him, his longtime friend and sparring partner, Paul Phoenix, placed a supportive hand on his shoulder. Well, this is it, Marshall. You've made it to the big one. Yeah, one step closer to that prize money. I'll finally be able to open my dojo. Remember, Law, I fought this guy once. He's not like anyone you've faced before. Stay focused. He's different. Different how? More handsome than you? Very funny. But seriously, just be careful out there. I've got a bad feeling about this guy. Look, I appreciate the concern, Paul, but I've got this. I'm fighting for my family after all. Don't worry. You know how good I am. I know. Okay then, go. Show him what the legendary dragon is made of. As Marshall began his final warm-up, Paul's expression grew serious. He glanced toward Kazuya, noting the cruel smile playing on the Mishima heir's lips. Something about Kazuya's demeanor sent a chill down Paul's spine. In the other corner, Kazuya stood alone, his eyes gleaming with an inhuman light. The power of the devil gene coursed through his veins, hidden but ever-present. He observed Marshall and Paul's interaction with cold amusement, already plotting how he would crush not only Law's body, but also his spirit. Martial Law versus Kazuya Mishima. From the moment the fight began, Marshall was on the defensive. Kazuya's strikes were heavy and relentless, his speed remarkable for someone with such power. Marshall fought back with everything he had, drawing on every lesson and every hardship he had endured. He moved with precision, evading Kazuya's attacks and countering whenever an opportunity arose. As the fight progressed, Kazuya's frustration began to mount. Marshall, though clearly outmatched in strength, was relentless and refused to give up. In a moment of anger, Kazuya partially tapped into his devil gene, his eyes flashing with an unnatural red glow. The sudden surge of power caught Marshall off guard and Kazuya struck with ferocity, injuring him badly. Though clearly defeated and barely able to move, Marshall refused to give up. He attempted to stand and continue the fight. Enraged by Law's persistence, Kazuya stood over Marshall, ready to deliver a final killing blow. Just as he raised his fist, a voice suddenly rang out. That's enough! Paul, who had been watching from the sidelines, rushed forward and threw himself between Marshall and Kazuya. With a powerful burning fist, Paul struck Kazuya forcing him back. Marshal, just stay put for a moment. The medics are on their way. No, it's not over yet. I can still. It is over, Marshal. It's okay. You did good. Paul, you were right about him. He's different. Just rest up. I'll handle him. 
Kazuya! You tried to kill my friend? You like fighting dirty? Then fight me. We'll settle this right now. You and me, there'll be no draws this time. You really don't remember, do you? You won't even acknowledge our fight! I've done nothing but train for this rematch for weeks! I'll finally get the recognition I deserve! I'll force you to acknowledge me! With the tension palpable, the tournament officials didn't dare interfere. Thus, the stage was set for the unofficial rematch between Kazuya Mishima and Paul Phoenix. After the tournament, Marshall recovered from his injuries and returned home to his family with good news. Despite not winning, the consolation prize money he earned for progressing as far as he did was enough to provide his family with much needed relief. On top of that, an unexpected blessing arrived. A generous gift from Yoshimitsu, another competitor, who had robbed the Mishima Zaibatsu and redistributed the wealth to poor families across many regions around the globe, including Marshall's neighborhood. This windfall allowed Marshall to finally achieve his dream of opening his own dojo. With the funds, he established a training space where he could pass on the teachings of Master Han Yip and provide a better life for his family. For the first time in a long while, the burden of financial struggle was eased, even if only slightly. It was a beginning, a small but significant step toward the future he had always envisioned. Not long after the grand opening, students began showing interest, many of them young, full of potential. As he guided them through their first stances, Marshall realized that the legacy he was building wasn't just about martial arts. It was about passing on the values Master Han Yip had instilled in him, discipline, balance, and the strength to rise above life's struggles. His students didn't know it yet, but they weren't just learning martial arts, they were learning to fight for themselves, for their dreams, just as he had. Marshall looked at the modest dojo he had built, filled with hope. He knew this was just the beginning. There were still many challenges ahead, but with his family beside him and the legacy of Master Han Yip to uphold, Marshall was ready. His journey had only just begun.